to something different, but sort of in the same space. This is about cardiology, and um, a Swedish company called Acarix. Uh, we're traded on, on First North Premier. Uh, we have our head office in, in Malmö, uh, but also development site in Denmark. So Acarix is, is addressing one of the most common reasons for, for visiting the doctor, which is chest pains. Um, Every day in the world, there's about a million patients that, that somehow seek health care for just types of various types of chronic or acute chest pains. And this happens to pretty much 30% of the population. Um, and typically, what chest pains is, that it can be a sign of coronary artery disease, but, it, but in, in the absolute vast majority, more than 90% of the instances, it's not. It's just related to stress and other types of comorbidity factors. But... Um, Typically what happens is that when I come in with a chest pain, I will be ordinated through a clinical pathway that can take weeks of invasive, imaging, various types of procedures to find out that, you know, Philip, the chest pain that you had was absolutely nothing. Um, so what we've um, developed is a point of care, AI-based with acoustics, to very rapidly, within a couple of minutes, figure out with very high precision, is this chest pain that you feel, is it a coronary blockage or not? Um, <clears throat> so how it works is that you put the uh, disposable sensor on the chest and then it listens to your flows and your coronary arteries. It does this for a couple of minutes. It uses machine learning and AI to calculate the flow and understand are we hearing turbulence or not? Or is it a clean flow? Um, so then the physician can very quickly get a score to understand, okay, Philip, you know, you're just having chest pains again because you've been working and drinking too much coffee. Or, you know, send them on for further evaluation. So this is based on about 15 years of R&D, um, mostly sprung out of Denmark. There's about 45 patents around this. It's CE marked and also de novo FDA cleared in the U.S. Um, Classic business model where um, the device is sold to physicians and then there's a single use patch which uh, creates the, the nice gross margin of a roughly 80%. Um, the trick is here is to get this into clinics, which is typically urgent care, it could be doctor's offices and, and also uh, emergency centers sometimes. Um, the lifetime value, once you get this in, the lifetime value of a device exceeds $75,000 in the US market. And that is just calculating on one patient a day. Uh, when we're seeing clinics now in the US, they have so many people sitting in the waiting room and just, you know, I have a chest pain and what do I do with these patients? So this gives the patient an immediate response and it gives the physician an immediate response. Um, so thanks to this, we were granted a CPT3 reimbursement code in 2022 for the US market. Um, and the positioning here, we worked with the ACC, which is the American College of Cardiology. We, we worked with them to help define how does this fit into the US market? Where, where is the, the pathway? So they helped us to create like this triage tree here saying that, okay, whenever anybody comes in with chest pain, take an EKG and then take an Acarix CAD score. Those are the kind of main first targets to do. And then, depending on the patient, whatever it finds, and yes, there are some exclusions where the patient has comorbidities and is above 70 years old, but in the vast majority, you can do this very quickly. And then you can find out, okay, Philip, you know, you can go home, you're fine, or send on the patient for more classic um, uh, diagnostic procedures. And this pathway and these products are now used within customers in the US. I'll come back to it. So we, we started by commercializing this in Europe. Uh, we went into Germany and Scandinavia. Um, nice, good, early com commercialization. Took ages, no reimbursement. H expensive, you know, trying to convince German physicians to do something different without, you know. It was a good way to learn, but it's not a way to make shareholders happy. So we just decided two years ago, let's just focus on the US. Um, and the U.S. is nice because there are, you know, millions of patients that, that need this. We have the F FDA clearance, we have the reimbursement code, and we have the support from this ACC to, to get this out. So we started by, by building, and I assign, and we put the CEO in the U.S. to mark the importance of it. Um, so in about a year and a half, we've gone to basically nothing to now have 40 sales reps covering the U.S. market. Uh, it's a hybrid type of sales model, so we're, 
we're not really paying for these sales reps. They are independent reps and they get commission and we own the full P&L of the customer. Um, where we focus mostly is in the Veterans Affairs Administrations, the VA. VA is the largest independent healthcare provider in the US with you know, 178 or 180 medical centers, 170, sorry. Uh, and we've um, scored the first deal with one of these VAs and we're having discussions with multiple of them now across the US. Um, and there's a lot of veterans that have these types of issues, so it per fits perfectly into that system. We are also working with smaller clinics and we are, you know, a CPT3 code is nice, but it also requires that you negotiate the payment levels with each payment provider. So it takes time, but we have now taking pay payer after payer after payer in each state to confirm and, and typically what this pays is somewhere between um, 110 and $600 to the provider. So we charge $75 for the single use patch and then the doctor can bill you know, up to $600. So there's a nice, we make some money, and most importantly, probably the physician makes money because that's what drives US business. Okay, super sharp team, of course, um, based here, as I said, Malmö, US, uh, mix, and um, a board of directors. Um, the star here is Marlou Jansen. She is Dutch. She used to be the, the president of Biotronic in the US and, and knows exactly how to make this happen. We also, this is expensive business like we all have. Um, we just closed a financing round of 54 million, a classic rights issue, classic discounts. Um, but we got decent good subscription and we got a very exciting good Danish life science fund that came in. So we've gone from a very retail based first North world to getting now finally an anchor investor in. So I'm very excited about getting that in. Okay. Wrapping up, you know, this is a, a very groundbreaking clinical solution that really meets a, a market need and um, it's de-risked. There's like 25,000 patients that have gone through this and uh, it's, an, it's a commercial phase and a commercial challenge as well. Um, but now I think we have, we have everything in place. Um, we have the financials in place and it's like everything else, it's just making it happen. Thank you. Thank you again. <laughs> Picking up uh, on the uh, investor side that you were talking about there, uh, could you elaborate a little bit on why this anchor investor is so important? Because, I mean, we, we've had uh, five, six, seven thousand retail investors into this, which has been a very good start, very important but we've lacked kind of a good, um, somebody who comes in and believes in the long term and somebody who can come in and, and defend when more money is needed. And it's, it's hard work. Um, there's not many out there. We used to have Seed Capital, which is a Danish, but, but they slowed down their business and we lost them. So um, um, <clears throat> we're in the classic phase. We have a market cap of about 150 million Swedish kroner and Nobody really just wants to come in and say, okay, I'll be the main shareholder here, take all the responsibility. So you've got to grow that s over time. Yeah. Could you also provide some insights into the strategic decision to shift your full commercial focus to the US market? This is a decision you made yeah, yeah, late absolutely. 2022. Yeah. Right? Yeah. No, we did it for several reasons. We, we saw that you know, this is going to take too much time in Europe. Um, and then very quickly we got the US reimbursement. Um, we said that's where the upside is. Um, it was a discussion with investors as well who just said, you know, skip Europe. Uh, keep it on hybrid, keep it running, um, but, you know, go all in. So, so for us, it's a challenging phase right now because the European business is still running okay, but it's kind of <laughs> slowing down while the US is taking off. So we're in, we're in the inflection point that the growth doesn't really, we can't really see the growth yet, but the US is doubling in speed right now and we're going to get there. Um, so that's why we did. Yeah. So how, how will you build a cost-effective and comprehensive geographic sales organization in the US? What's the, what's yeah. the plan? <laughs> no, so we, we, uh, we started by hiring a couple of sales reps and, and quickly said this, saw that this is too expensive for us. And then we signed a, an agreement with a cardiology sales group called Complement. 
And they had 40 sales reps already selling pacemakers and other things. So they were already in this world and just could bring on another product. And um, like I said, they, they sell, we pay them commission, and we own the customer and we own the full gross margin. Moving on to some, some more product specific questions. First of all, are there any similar products out there? No, there isn't, which is challenging. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to have some good competitors. Yeah. And uh, do you always need to have an EKG check in combination with your product? No, you don't, not at all. Um, it's just that EKG has been, you know, it's since the Nobel Prize of it, it's, it's kind of the de facto standard, so everybody gets it. Right. Um, so it's you know checking the electronics and this is checking the mechanics. Um, so so that's not why it's a good combination. There's no interference between them. Right. Yeah. Could you talk a bit about the specificity and sensitivity? Yeah. So the sensitivity here is very high, but the specificity is very low. Uh, and we are working to increase the specificity, but this is not yet uh, a, a kind of a screening device for the mass public. It's more to rule out. That's why the, we're working on the specificity side. Um, we need so m we need hundreds of thousands of data points to be able to ultimately improve the specificity. But uh, there is enough business case in running on the rule out side. Um, but we're, you know, the ultimate vision is that everybody can just be screened in 10 minutes to see if they have potential blockage uh, in, in the heart. Yeah. And returning to the US, what does reimbursement in the US really mean? At what level is the reimbursement? Is it specific healthcare providers and so on? Yeah. If you could just so, elaborate. So that, yeah. So when you get a CPT3 code, you don't get a specific payment. You only get the right for providers to bill, so there's a code. So then they send in a bill and say, hey, I've used the CAD score device. And then they just bill. They just make up a number. And then it's up to the insurance provider to pay whatever they think is rational. So then you send in like a justification deck. And that's why it's, there's a spread in the amount. And then once you've proven over a few years, you know, that you find some kind of a median payment level for this, you can then apply for a CPT-1 code. And then you get like a national uh, CMS-based reimbursement coverage. Um, so new technologies come in via CPT-3, which is reasonably easy, I have to say. So I can recommend it to everybody who's trying. Um, but then you have the hard work of setting the payment levels. But you've got to start somewhere. And there's a lot of companies in the US who've built a very successful business on just doing CPT-3. And then once they get a CPT-1, uh, they actually lower the rates. Um, so it, it's a balance of how you want to go with that. Yes, because there is actually a question here about what the roadmap, your roadmap looks like yep. moving from CP3 to, yep. to 1. So, so that, but that is the roadmap. So, but you need like a whole comprehensive bag of, of payment evidence and, and uh, showing the billing history. And ultimately, CPT1 codes typically require some kind of a US clinical study. But we've also learned that if you can prove that the business case is established, that is an alternative to a big, fancy, expensive study. Uh, we are, absolutely, ultimately. But I, my best guess, without saying too much, is probably going to take three to five years. Uh, Would that include developing new clinical data? Well, well, yeah, we'll have clinical data on the way, but I don't foresee us doing any type of expensive studies to do it. Yeah. But when we started this endeavor, we thought we would have to pay like 30 million Swedish kroner for a US study to get to CPT-1, and that we don't believe anymore. Right. Thank you so much, Philip. We will, now we will let you off stage. Thank you, thank you. <laughs>